Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the town board of the town of Austin work session for Tuesday, November 15th, 2022. Please rise and join me for the pledge of defense. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. So I'll have a work session this Thursday, November 17th at 7 p.m. Please join Open Arms for Refugees and award-winning journalist, author, and filmmaker Lita Navi for a screening of Afghanistan Undercover at the Austin Public Library. I will be joining Lita for a discussion after the viewing of this compelling documentary. You can also join via Zoom if you cannot be in person. Visit austinlibrary.org for more information. Westchester Collaborative Theater presents Living Music, six original plays inspired by six iconic songs featuring local Austin talent, vocal artist Anne Carpenter, Friday, November 18th at 8 p.m., Saturday, November 19th at 2 at 8 p.m., and Sunday, November 20th at 3 p.m. Get your tickets at wctheater.org. This Saturday, November 19th at 3 p.m. is the last installment of the Talk Culture book series for 2022. This month's book is The Girl with a Loudian Voice by Abby Dare, and copies of the book are available at the Austin Public Library Circulation Desk. Speed reading. This Sunday, November 20th from 1.45 to 6 p.m., the Lada House will be hosting free Thanksgiving meals to any and all community or for any and all community residents who are facing hardships at the St. Anne's School Gym. Uh, they will also be delivering free hot dinners to those unable to attend in person. You can make a donation to or sponsor this effort by visiting thelotofhouse.org, or you can also drop off turkeys to be distributed to those in need at St. Anne's Rectory Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This is a wonderful event, and anybody who also would like to volunteer to help serve the meals, um, I'm sure that they are looking for help starting at 1 o'clock. Neighbors Link is collecting new unwrapped gifts for children and youth ages 0 to 12 and gift cards for teenagers 13 to 18 to fill the shelves of their Mercado de Fiestas or holiday market, where parents in the community will be able to select gifts for your their children. You can drop off gifts now through December 1st to the Neighbors Link Center at 2325 Spring Street in Austin on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Or you can also buy gifts at Penny and Ting for this collection and they will deliver from the store. We're also collecting donations of unwrapped toys as part of Toys for Tots at the Austin Municipal Building. And I'm sure that ODCC will be also hosting their annual toy drive uh, do you have any details on that yet, or they're not quite? Yeah, the box would usually go out the day of, um, the weekend of Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay, so we'll have more information as uh, we know where those boxes are going to be placed. <clears throat> Support the Austin Children's Center with at their festive fair this Friday, November 18th, and Saturday, November 19th, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., starting at 1143 Pleasantville Road in Briarcliff. Shop unique holiday gifts at March Boutique, Wondrous Things, and Holbrook Cottage, and a percentage of your purchase will support the Austin Children's Center. They are also having a luncheon on Friday. I'm not sure that they're full, so they'll probably get tickets to that as well. The Austin Small Business Scavenger Fund is on now, today through November 29th. The more you shop, the more chances you get to win a basket of goodies from Austin businesses. Pick up a scavenger hunt card at any participating business or visit Facebook to see the event. Participants include but are not limited to Sing Sing Kill Brewery, Mike Bristol Music, Hudson Valley Books for Humanity, Penny and Ting, Alita's Home, and many, many others. Shop local this holiday season. And that's the idea. That is it for my announcements. Anybody else have additional questions? Hearing none. Up uh, first, we have the one and only Mario Blurdo to give us the departmental report on our parks department. Mario, you are on. Please unmute. Good evening, everyone. How you doing? <clears throat> Can you hear me? No. Yes, very good. I can hear you. All right. Um, 
obviously, of course, thank you to Victoria for putting these pictures together. I know sometimes when I just start sending to her, it can be overwhelming. Um, big thank you to my guys, Mark, Alvin, and Larry, for always giving it their best, going above and beyond all the time. And thank you to Jose and Jose Sr., Jose Jr., Jose Sr. Um, these are going to be just pictures, obviously, of projects we're able to get done from June till now. As always, besides these projects, we're also dealing with our regular daily duties of garbage and all the parks. Hey, Mario. What? Yeah. Mario, can you get a little closer or something? Like, it's hard to hear you. We have to line. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Thank you. You know, as always, our regular duties of garbage, washing the spray park from when, every day from when it opens to the closing season, um, cleaning bathrooms every day, the art center, marking the fields, and cutting grass. So these are going to be just some pictures of the projects we got done. This is um, the new fencing at the, uh, the Finch Field. Um, you see the concrete. We did uh, concrete most strips around the, uh, the baselines and then on the outer, on the outfield, we actually did a, like a plastic mow strip, which is gonna help prevent any uh, damage from us cutting grass and grabbing it with the machines. Um, the Finch field, which is that this field has 30 foot high nets now. It has padding on um, all the outfield fence and there's padding behind the dugouts. Next picture. This is behind the backstop now. It's all padded and I guess talking to the baseball league and stuff, we always had issues um, with parents and umpires arguing. So now there really isn't any viewing from behind the, uh, the backstop. So it shouldn't interfere with the kids playing. This is the harder field. Um, you can see the concrete curve is just to show how low the dugout was. This is more work we're probably gonna have to do in the spring in, in raising the dugout. This is, again, this, this field has, you see the big poles, it has 40 foot high nets because um, of the age group that plays here. So now hopefully there shouldn't be any more smashed windshields in the parking lot because when all three fields are playing at Ryder Park, it does get kind of congested and, and, and hard to park places. So now hopefully this will definitely help. Um, that's just the padding, the new padding behind the backstop. This is just to show again, the most strips we did, the concrete. This field only has concrete on the sides. Um, there will be work to be done in the spring and raising the clay and, and the sides with dirt and planting new grass. So you won't see all that concrete. You'll just see the top of it. This is, again, just to show the, where it turns green and dirt. That's just dirt. We had to raise the field. Otherwise, there'd be gaps underneath the, uh, the new fencing. Because with this fencing, too, instead of like a cable being on the bottom, you can't see it in the pictures, but there is, it's a commercial fence. So there are rails now on the bottom, which are more durable and should last a lot longer. That's just another picture of the field. Mm -hmm. The pictures don't do it justice. It really, both companies that were there were really professional and really did a really great job. Uh, I think yeah. there's an issue with that. Just okay. Oops. Sorry. We were <laughs> we just started in the middle of that. Okay. We're, we're starting yeah, we started backwards anyway. <laughs> Back in the beginning. Okay. Sorry about that. There you go. Yeah. This is just the machine we rent when we do our, our playground wood chips. That's the excavator feeding it. Mark drives the containers. He keeps dropping containers, swapping them. So we keep having mulch. You keep going. And then Alvin. Oh, well, oh. on the other side of that machine, there would have been a, a hose, and usually there's someone just using it. This is the boogie, the buggy that we use. Um, this was at the cemetery, just doing foundations. That's just concrete going in the hole for foundation. That's the boogie, the buggy. I would say boogie. Um, yeah, these pictures are all off, I think. <laughs> this is a... Uh, you thanked Victoria at the beginning, and you just gotta wait us to the end. Yeah, I think that it's only the first couple that are out of order. Now, okay. now we, should be, we should be back in business, but that's it. Yeah, like, if you really go back sad. one, if you go back one, yeah, that's okay. that's at the other end of the hole. So basically, you're just constantly feeding this machine, and the the wood chips just get sprayed out. I mean, it's cut our downtime. We do pretty much all our playgrounds in like three days, where it used to take us over a week. So there's no more wheelbarrowing and stuff like that. It's just park it at one place and just spread mulch. That's just an after picture of all the mulch down. Um, this is what the beach looks like after. Oh, before one of our cleanings. 
Um, it's all driftwood and stuff. That's just in our container, all the wood we picked up. Um, <clears throat> this is down at the waterfront stage. Um, every year we were replacing lattice. So finally we were able to get our, our fabricator to make a metal lattice. So we replaced the plastic with a uh, metal painted it white. So we pretty much did, well, that's us painting it in the shop. We primed it and then painted it white and that's the new lattice now. So I can't see anybody. What happens is people just sit on the stage and kick their feet. And that was what was breaking the lattice. Um, <laughs> this is the 4th of July. That's Mark and Alan there in the bare feet. Um, we actually had those borders where we flooded the uh, spray park this year when, before we did our fireworks um, just to hold water in there. Because the first year we actually had our fireworks after the fort was done. We had some minor burns in it. So this actually worked and no damage was done. <clears throat> this was a uh, girl uh, swing set. This is the old swing set we had. We were actually able to reuse those black plastic borders. We had to take everything apart and prep it for the uh, compound contractors to install the new swing. All right, now we're jumping the speed bumps. This is uh, this was Cedar Lane speed bumps. Where that's Mark drilling into the asphalt. Um, these are similar to the, well, they're the same speed bumps we got at Ryder Park. At Ryder Park, because we didn't have the time, we didn't anchor them, so we just laid them down. But Cedar Lane is anchored and they don't move. So we will be doing Ryder Park. We still have all, the, we kept all the, the hardware and stuff. So since this worked in, in springtime, we'll anchor Ryder Park speed bumps. So then they just stay there permanently. Are you going to pull them up for the winter? Go clap? No. Oh, I got to just make sure I got signs coming. I got to make sure the highway knows Cedar Lane to raise their clouds. It's a lot of Usually it's a lot the of village pulls, pulls them up in, this, in the allotted uh, 16 croat and they pull them up for winter. Yeah, that's only like two or three. These are, these are, these are, there's eight of them and there's, I don't even know because they're all in sections. There's each one probably has like 30 pieces of hardware. So we'll see how it goes. I, don't, I think if, the highways on board with my guys i don't think we're the only ones that plow there so i don't see it being that big of a problem <clears throat> um this was at Ryder park the playground we had to uh the gaga pit that the girl scouts did a couple years back i mean there was no nothing inside but there was grass but then all the wear and tear so we actually prepped it with gravel and stone dust and then put a uh, turf inside of it and then we just had to put it back together so that's and we uh, we moved it up a little bit from where it was so it's still in the very program. popular, popular camp at Ryder. yeah especially, especially during camp yeah every day it got used pretty much every day this is a tree that pete had cut had taken well, cut down at uh dale cemetery um, we, I told him to save it, um, cause we will be milling it this winter to make boards for our garden. This was, uh, our, uh, like midsummer cleanup on our fields. We edged it. You see all the grass. We edged the baselines, the outer field line, and then we put down new, new clay. That's the picture with the new clay. That's the finch field. Obviously now there's new fencing. This is just. That was the old thing. This is uh, the 9-11 memorial for 9-11. We uh, planted uh, mums. This was at Dale Cemetery. We uh, power washed the, the white fence by the cottage, and then we painted it, and we replaced the one corner post. Would you see it missing there? I don't think I sent a, a picture of, of when it was done. That was before. Um, this was before pictures of Gerlach. We got the, the Mooga back there. You see the caged in. That was done a few years ago. And then from that down to the entrance, which was in really bad shape, that's just patchwork. And then there should be a picture of just it newly paved. So that's new asphalt, like I said, from the Mooga all the way down to the entrance. Um, this is Ryder Park. We actually were able to do some crack repairs and sealing this year. Um, we were able to get the pavilion areas done and the lower parking lot at Ryder Park. That's just a picture of a crack. This was Ryder Pavilion. There was a lot of cracking done there. Um, we, were, we had to cut this patch out. Um, we had the help of the highway department that day to help us with the blacktop. 
that's us putting the patch in. And then that's us sealing. You can see the, the wetter part, that's sealing with squeegees in the machine that we did some work on. We've had the seal machine for a couple of years. Um, we're finally able to use it. We did some modifications to it and it works great. <laughs> so hopefully this could be part of our routine. That's just, that's Ryder Park after we sealed it and did some crack repairs and the big patch. This is Cedar Lane. We did the pavilion area and the walkway to the, uh, the bathroom. It's a combination of spraying and squeegee work, especially around the, uh, the walkways and the pavilion, just to be careful not to stain anything. You can see the difference in colors. That's us coming down. That's us when it's done. <clears throat> Same thing at Girl Act by the bathrooms. We did a, a lot of squeegee work. And then the rest, as we got down by the pavilion, we were able to spray. This was a concrete bench um, we made. We have forms now where we can actually make these at our shop. Um, this was donated. I can't zoom in. I forget the guy's name, but this David was a Krieger. town. Yes, he was a Krieger. town. Yeah, he was a town board member. He walk. He worked. He, he walks at Sally Swope a lot. So that bench now sits at uh, Sally Swope. To honor his wife. Yes, his wife had uh, passed away. So we we installed the plaque to it, and then we put it out a couple weeks ago. These are just pictures of dead trees at uh, Ryder Park. We had a lot of tree work this year, uh, mostly cedar lane. Um, we did have poison ivy removal, which I talked about in the last presentation at the waterfront, actually all the parks. Um, but these are just pictures of some dead trees we had to get done. By, that's a dead tree over wires. That, that was that first dead tree you saw. Same tree. Um, this was uh, the finch field after we took down the old fence. This is just pruning back. That's the oak tree. There was a lot of pruning there, a lot of dead stuff. Um, the whole old fence line, or now with new fences, it was all trimmed back just so there was no overhanging stuff over the new fence and field. <clears throat> this was a Grill Act Pavilion bathroom roof. Um, we finally got around to it. We did the pavilion roof a couple of years ago um, and it seemed to hold. So we just actually did this. That's what it looked like before and then after. Um, we do have some painting to do of the soffits and stuff. So hopefully in the spring um, or sometime next year, we'll be able to do that and possibly paint the building. Uh, this is just a broken pipe there at the bottom electric conduit that um, powers our pavilion. Someone must have crashed into it or hit it. Um, so that was broken, which got replaced by our annual bidder. Someone pulled, I don't know, the cover off of that and the wires were hanging. One day we went there. I know we were missing extension cords. So um, another picture, I don't think it's gonna be in this one, but yeah. So now we have motion sensor lights um, on all four corners of the pavilion like we do at Ryder, just hopefully to deter people when they go there, the lights go on, hopefully prevents for anybody doing any kind of vandalism or damage. And like I said, our, we used to have our outlets were up in the ceiling. So we ran extension cords, people were taking them. So now I don't have a picture of it, but there's outlets where the outlets were, they actually got dropped down. So there's no more need for extension cords, but so that's not a picture of that. That's a picture of the sensor lights we have, the motion sensor lights. This is Sally Swope. Um, we were back there a couple of weeks ago. We were able to put topsoil down in that center area and plant grass. That's that whole center area now. If you drive by, obviously there's seed and hay. And I started to, it's been a little over a week. The grass started to come out. Um, this was the picture back. If you saw that other pile of dirt when we first started, um, we rented a screener. Um, we screened about a couple hundred yards of topsoil from dirt. I've saved over the years of doing projects in the parks. We've just saved it at Cedar Lane and knowing we were, I wanted to do this sooner, but we just didn't have the time. So knowing, knowing how much dirt we're going to need at the, at the ball fields at Ryder in the spring, um, so we're just getting ready for it. So instead of buying dirt, well, uh, we should have plenty to, to do it. That's after it's screened. So it's basically screen top. So we actually use some at Sally Swope. Um, this is the where the, the Sally Swope where the entrance is, where the sign is. Um, we regraded and planted the grass there. We actually put rocks around the sign. Um, plantings do have to go back there. All the plantings that were planted were dead. Um, we also put rocks 
I don't know if you could tell by this. There you go. By the road. Um, this was happening. A lot of the buses and cars and trucks would just stop and pull off the road and just make a muddy mess. I know the guy across the street, he kept telling us he was going to do rocks. I was like, listen, I have the plan to do it. We just didn't have the time. So now that's done. So what's left, there's a couple areas we have to do the two beds and then the area on, on the left at the entrance we have to do hopefully in the spring. Um, just don't have enough time for this winter is almost here. So depending on what the weather does, I don't know if we will be back this year. This is just old fencing from uh, on the Finch field. You guys already saw the new fencing, um, but we did take, we took all the, I mean, it's hard to tell, but this fence was all leaning. Um, it's about to fall, but we did take the fence down the old fence just to save some money. And then, then obviously the fence installs in uh, company. That's just the part the netting was falling on the middle field. And that's a harder field. Not the middle. That's, that's, um, Alvin and Mark power washing the, the foul poles. Um, we painted half of them because um, we were rushing to get stuff done. We have to paint the rest of the half. We just got the bottom half done where the new fence was. So in the spring, we have to actually finish painting them. Um, these are this, just the guys uh, putting in, digging. They're actually putting concrete here into the footings for the new poles. That's just the, the sleeve and the, the rebar and stuff for the footings. And then obviously the poles go in that sleeve. That's just the machine of them picking them up. And that's them putting it in. So like I said, the finch field is now 30 feet high and the middle field is 40 feet high. That's the prep work of doing the, the most strips. We had to put forms. Um, we put gravel and then the concrete, which you guys already saw. That's just showing the depth of the footings that's yeah that's the finish that was before they put the new fence that's just to show I and mean, it's hard to tell but those black poles have two white lines so the bottom white line is the bottom of the chain link the top line is the pole so you can see not each pole the gap would have been if we didn't put the dirt for now we just only put it underneath the fence and now you just have to feather it into the rest of the field it's hard to explain but it's you get a visual of otherwise there would have been yeah there's a better picture so now you only see one white line so that would be the pipe and then the chain link now hits the dirt otherwise some spots had six inch gaps eight inch gaps it was all different throughout the field center field wasn't that bad it was more the sides but you guys already saw this this was the new fence after with the most strip that's just the after picture of the Finchfield. Actually, you go inside the, the Finchfield, it just feels like you're in a little stadium now. It's actually pretty cool. Hopefully, uh, in the springtime, they could all enjoy it. Yeah, there is one. I think that's it. A lot of work. Uh, yes, it is. Fantastic. It's great. Yeah. Any questions? A lot of work. I'm sure that everybody's going to enjoy those fields uh, for many years to come. And uh, also, I know that the parking lot was done when last last year. I can't remember now. This yeah, year, last year. Yeah, the, dug, the dugouts have been well. That's a project that was supposed to get done a couple years ago. But I mean, it's a good what? thing we never. The dugouts. We remember. I don't know if you remember, but that's been yeah. in the works to get those done. So now, obviously we could go through with it and actually get it done because we're halfway there. <laughs> so the reason we, uh, I knew it was going to be involved. So it's kind of, I'm kind of glad we didn't do it, but now it needs to be done. So now I can finally get done. That's great. Again, I was there with some, was there, with, I ran into Brooks there um, because there were a couple of kids who were like, why didn't we get to play on these fields and all this this year? So. They just aged out, but anyway, um, there have been plenty more kids who get to play on these fields for many years to come, and hopefully, um, we'll keep kids, the, the parents away from the backstops, yelling what they shouldn't be yelling, and uh, the balls away from the car windshields, and um, everybody will be a little happier. Um, thank you for all the work that went into it. It was uh, a lot of work, and obviously, besides the fields, all the other work that you did, and. You pulled the docks out, and went to rise. Oh, yeah. the, the, 
yesterday we took the docks out. I forgot. Yesterday we took the docks out the waterfront. Today we winterized everything, all the bathrooms, sprinklers. So we're in good shape. Next couple of weeks will just be mulching and blowing leaves. Sounds great. And that's it, right? Everything's done. All the projects are done now. That's it. Well, I mean, <laughs> that was a joke. They're never okay. full, yeah. They're never full. Yeah, it was just a joke. It was a joke. Okay. Um, anyway, great. And so, anything else? Do you guys any, any have questions? Questions? Comments? No? All good? All right. Fantastic. You don't have anything else, Mario, that you want to add? Uh, any pictures of grass sent? No, no. That was it. All right. Which is gracias. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Thanks to thanks to all your guys for all the good work. And uh, please pass that on to us. Okay. I will. I in general. Thanks. All right. We'll see you soon. Have a good night. Stay on or you know, what? Have stay on or you have to stay on to the bitter end. So when do we make you stay on? Of course you can go. Oh, all right. Have a good night, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving if I don't see any of these. Thanks. Bye. 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 All right, so next up, we have a presentation of the 2023 tentative budget from Budget Director Victoria Caprelli. We know a budget is a roadmap for the safe and effective operations of the town, and I thank all of our department heads, plus our finance team, Dale Brennan, Liz McCarry, and Victoria Caprelli, for helping turn a vision into this fiscally responsible and responsive roadmap. Take it away, Victoria. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So our 2023 budget. So the 2023 year, 2023 budget will run our uh, fiscal year of January 1 through December 31st of 2023. Uh, just a little background on the process. The way the budget process starts is in September, um, where uh, request forms are prepared by all the department heads and reviewed initially by our finance team and town supervisor's office. Um, and then the tentative budget is submitted to the town clerk by October 30th. This year, we submit it to the town clerk on October 27th. And the tentative budget has been available on the town's website since then for the public to review um, and our copies are also available at the library and the town clerk's office should anyone want to come and view a hard copy of the budget. Um, by uh, New York State law, we have to have the budget, adopt, budget adopted by December 20th. Um, we are aiming for our December 13th legislative session. Um, and we did discuss this in depth with the town board um, two weeks-ish ago. Um, department by department throughout our entire budget. So this is gonna be a little bit more of an overview, but those meetings are posted to our YouTube channel if anyone wants to view uh, anything in more detail. So um, for those of you not familiar out there in the world, um, the town budget has multiple components, the first being the town general budget, um, which uh, in, encompasses the residents of the village or homeowners or taxpayers in the village of Austin, village of Barclay Manor, and an unincorporated, and unincorporated area. Then we have the unincorporated area, which is just um, homeowners or properties within the unincorporated area. And what is uh, the services that are provided to uh, those folks are code enforcement, police services, and our highway department services. We then have a number of special districts, including our townwide water fund, our sewer fund, our light, fire, and refuse funds, our ambulance fund, and our Dale Cemetery fund, which is a non-taxing fund, but it is a fund in and of itself anyway. So um, the big question for everybody is, you know, when you look at your tax bill year to year, um, how does it break down? Where have, where do the components go? So approximately 10% of, um, of properties taxes goes to Westchester County or county, uh, you know, general operating. And then they have a number of special districts as well, including some of the sewer funds and so on and so forth. The town of Austin or the town general is less than 3% of most, most people's tax bills. School district is the lion's share between 60 and 70%. And then the local municipality. So for some people who live in the town of Austin, that's their village tax. If they live in the village of Austin or the village of Briarcliff, um, or those who live in an unincorporated area, that is, um, the, this would be their local municipality tax, which is between 15 and 25%. So we cover this town of Austin portion, the general portion, and then the local municipality tax for those in the unincorporated area. 
So some highlights we are looking at proposed expenditures in the general fund of just over $6 million and in the unincorporated fund, including the highway fund, about $7.5 million. Um, looking at the tax rates, which are calculated based upon the the expenditures or the levy, um, as well as the assessed value of these districts. Um, we are looking at tax rate decreases in the general fund of about 6.5% and about 6.3% for the unincorporated area. Um, but of course, those two factors go into this. So it's not just about expenditures, it's also about the assessed value of, of the total pie of how the taxes get distributed. So. Um, even though the tax rate is going down, most people are going to see that their tax bill will go up slightly. So on an average homeowner in the town general, we're looking at a tax bill increase of about $13 this year, and for unincorporated, about $64 from 2020, 2022 to 2023. Um, we are hopeful that that is nominal for most, most property owners and people certainly are going to get, you know, good bang for the buck for uh, the, the work that we put into this um, here in the town. So I'm going to dive in a little bit more to the town general course in this less than 3% of your uh, tax bill for most people in the town. And all of the services that go into it. So this includes our, our core administration, the town supervisor's office, which we also handle grant administration, environmental initiatives, tax collection, assessment, town clerk and elections, senior services, town parks, food scraps recycling, rent on the space where we operate, and then celebrations like our summer concert series, food truck Fridays, fireworks, and Juneteenth festival. Um, so that's all that goes into that 3% portion of your tax bill, or about $371 for the average assessed value, or the average average home in, in town general, which is worth approximately $500,000. We'll look at that $371. This is about how it breaks down. So as you can see, um, the largest portion of that goes towards our employee benefits. Um, and that, and so that includes our health insurance, life insurance, dental insurance, all that good stuff, retirement, um, and then broken down into other departments. So some are larger than others. You'll see the whole list here, which is slightly blocked by our Zoom Zoom room, but um, these are all of the different departments in the town general budget. Um, we have our park, senior program, justice support, um, and defense service so, um, tablets. Okay, looking now at the local municipality tax for those in the unincorporated area, which again is about 15 to 25 percent of um, one's tax bill. <laughs> And that covers public safety, recreation, building, planning, zoning, engineering, stormwater management, road maintenance, and snow removal, fire, fire, highway department. And so for the average home in the unincorporated area, that tax bill is about $2,300 per year. Uh, so definitely more than town general, but for uh, comparison purposes, the average home in the village of Briarcliff um, most most residents or average average home would pay about forty seven hundred dollars a year in the village of Austin, it's about forty one hundred dollars a year. So again, an unincorporated town continues to be um, pretty efficient good in deal. terms of a yeah, pretty good deal uh, in terms of how we allocate allocate resources. Okay, and when we look at the the unincorporated fund and the highway fund the largest percentage is police services. Then we have highway maintenance and administration, everything related to the highway department. And then also employee benefits also being high up there, plus you know some of these other, other services. Um, since police services is the largest portion, I just wanna focus in on that a little bit. Um, we are at the end of a uh, contract term with the Village of Austin for police services. The, car, the current contract that we're under um, will, will end at the end of 2022. Um, so we have been in negotiations with the Village of Austin for the, the continuation of this IMA. Um, and I have up here, these are the proposed rates that have been prepared by the Village of Austin for those services um, in, two, in 2023. 
at about 2.4 million, a little 2.4 million, um, and increasing over the course of another four-year contract. Um, so we have been, you know, working closely with the village of Austin um, and uh, working on the, the contract to, you know, finalize the contractual piece of this arrangement. Um, and we hope to have that before the board for approval um, sometime in December. Um, but looking at this and kind of looking at, you know, what, what, what are the town's options here? We did take a look at what the town was paying when Westchester County provided those services to the town um, in 2014 was the last year covered by Westchester County. And at that time, the town was paying 2.3 million for Westchester County services. So when we compare compare where we're, where we're at now in 2023, we are just sort of going over that mark that the town was paying for the county services way back in 2014. So over the course of the you know eight years that the town has been working with the village of Austin, we've had you know, approximately two million dollars in savings over those eight years so um you know our relationship with the village you know continues to be um, a way that we can keep that tax bill down in comparison to our neighbors um so i just wanted to note that there since that is a, a change and something new in the 2023 budget um, that will be before the board shortly to consider Okay, and then we have a number of special districts, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we have our sewer fund, which, you know, operates our whole sewer system um, for the uh, this year, um, for the first time in a number of years, we are increasing the sewer unit charge um, to reflect increased costs associated with that district. Um, so that's something, something new that hadn't been increased for many years. Um, Maybe many, many years. <laughs> Dale, I don't know if you can weigh in on that. It has not it has not been increased in the time that I've been involved working on the town budget. So uh, it's been at least uh, 10 years at, at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have street lighting, fire protection, um, which is traceable agreements with the village of Austin and the village of Briarcliff for fire protection, refuse collection. We actually do have a bid out for our uh, refuse um, collection, which um, bids are due back to the town this week. So we'll be getting final numbers on that soon. But, um, you know, we are anticipating increase um, according to CPI. Um, and then our ambulance services, um, which is the district that serves all of Austin except for the village of Briarcliff there. So village of Austin and then incorporated area. Um, we continue to stay compliant with the New York State tax cap. Um, so the way that this uh, law works is that a municipality is entitled to increase the levy by 2% or in the rate of inflation, whichever is less. So uh, this year, the rate of inflation is uh, unfortunately much higher than 2%, um, but the, so the tax cap is at a true 2%. That is not always the case. There have been years where inflation was less than 2%. Um, we were also entitled to carry over funds that we did not use towards the levy in 2022 into the 2023 budget of that $89,000. And um, un we are we continue to be under the tax cap again this year by about forty six thousand dollars. So now that's been banked away for the twenty twenty four budget. So when this comes up again, that's that's the money socked away for for next year's budget. Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, highlights of our capital plan. The capital plan includes many more projects that are slated for this year and next year. Um, so certainly if anybody wants to take a look at that in more detail, it's available on the town's website. We did also discuss it in detail at the special meetings. So these are just a couple of highlights. In our parks, we've got some exciting grants um, lined up for the Angle Park, some field improvements at Gerlach, new playgrounds at Gerlach and Ryder. Um, and in the highway department, sort of the big project that we'll be looking to go out to bond for this year is to pave Tappan Terrace and Leadwood Drive, kind of completing that area of town as, uh, you know, repaving over the past couple of years. So looking at Lewis Angle Park, we do have, um, this picture is a little hard to see with the Zoom thing, but um, we have, uh, we have secured a grant from Westchester County CDBG program to relocate the bathroom facility. And so this is a park, uh, picture from one of the summer, uh, the concerts this summer, um, to relocate the bathroom facility to the Southern end of the park, closer to the beach and to the spray park and the playground area where more families are and also open up space to uh, create more space for people to come and enjoy 
events like the summer concert series. I also included some of the, um, the visuals that we proposed for um, as part of the town submission to the village's uh, DRI program or the DRI funding to uh, reconstruct the uh, stage, a new stage at Lewis Angle Park. So these are some of the, the visionary designs that we had put together um, and, but, and uh, uh, put together a budget for. So um, we're hoping that we'll be successful at getting some of that grant funding. And um, for the new audience, DRI is the Downtown Revitalization Commission. That's, uh, that's one. Yes. And we did also submit a grant to uh, New York State in addition to the, to the funding um, to hopefully get even more money for us and we'll see. So hopefully we'll find that out within the next month or so and we can get started on these projects at projects Lewis Angle Park. Again, we already have the funding secured to move the bathroom facility, which is gonna be sort of phase one of this whole uh, revitalization of Lewis Angle Park. Um, so those are some of the projects that we have listed in our capital plan for Angle. Um, at Gerlach, uh, so we just we just saw our uh, our parks foreman go through all the lovely pictures of the new uh, fencing at Ryder Park Fields. Um, we are going to do the same treatment at Gerlach Park to improve the fencing situation there. Um, and also, we have been planning for a number of years to upgrade the um, the lights at this field to LED lights to save on. Our energy costs and also so that it can be used um, by the recycling plants. Right. To make it easier for, for this park to be used um, after, after dark, too, by our community groups. We also have two grants from our uh, state senator, Elijah Reichel Melnick, and incoming state senator, Pete Harkum, for uh, new playgrounds at Girl Like and Ryder Park. Uh, I just included it here. Picture we got our giant check and then also uh, a rendering of an option for the playground at Ryder Park. We are going to be circulating these to the Rec Advisory Board um, and the public for some input. Um, this was uh, a rendering that had been prepared by the uh, by the vendor so we could put in a budget number for the grant, but I thought it'd be good to kind of show we're hoping to at least at Ryder Park incorporate some elements of the adult fitness uh, similar to what we have at Lewis Angle Park because that's been very popular. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to incorporate that as well as inclusive, um, you know, accessible play areas for kids of, of all ages and ages. So it should be fun. Okay. So what, what happens next here? Um, we have our uh, budget public hearing scheduled for Tuesday, November 22nd, our next legislative session. And um, we will hopefully have the budget before the board to adopt, not the 2023 budget, Oh yes, the 2023 budget, what year is it? <laughs> um, on Tuesday, December 13th. And it's available online. So anyone who wants to take a look at it um, in as much detail as you'd like, it is there and posted. Fantastic. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A great overview of what we got. And just ask my four colleagues if anybody has any questions or comments. I'd like to chime in. Thank you for working so hard. Maria Dale, yeah. Liz, Dana, thank you all very, very, very much. We've already got over it line by line, so we have a great confidence. Okay. Wonderful. Um, okay. Well, thank you. So we're going to just keep moving right along. And I think, uh, again, our Comptroller Dale Brennan, our Deputy Comptroller Liz Sakari, you guys totally off the hook if you want to leave. I don't think we, can, we don't have any questions. You're, you're good to go. I'm very appreciative of all the work that goes into this and uh, also Victoria again for putting it all together, crunching those numbers. Thank you, making it all work. We appreciate it. You guys have anything you want to add? I, I should have asked. No, you're good. Dad, did you want to say anything? Uh, I would just like to say uh, thank you very much. It's always a uh, a great experience every year. We still learn new things along the way, and uh, it's it's been a fabulous uh, run doing these budgets uh, with you. So I appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you. Great, fantastic. So moving right along. Next up, we are um, going to be talking about our artist communities. Uh, proposed local law. Following several weeks of public hearings, um, we 
received some feedback from our planning board. So tonight we're discussing again a proposed local law to establish a special permit use for furnace communities. And I'm going to turn it over to our town council, President Tom Madonna, to walk us through the latest draft of this law. So Victoria, I'm, I was, do you want me to share my? Yeah. I have, I have, yeah. I'm in the news. Oh, you are not Yeah. I was ready to have a Yeah. I should just keep myself muted and just work for this. Yeah. Okay. So I'll share my screen and we can just run through. So as the supervisor mentioned, this has been um, before the board for several months now. Um, we received comments from the county planning department, which were generally favorable. Uh, we also received comments by memo dated October 21st from the planning board. And so given that we are kind of coming to the end of the process, um, the town staff and consultants went through the law again. Um, we also realized that um, because we have this new local law, relatively new from last year regarding special events, um, kind of making sure that the, these two uses um, can work in a way that makes sense and that isn't creating another use that may not have been anticipated um, because obviously the main intent of this is for artist communities uses uh, per the local law adopted last year. Um, there is a separate provision that under certain circumstances requires special event permits. So we were just trying to make sure that they, those two can operate in a, in a cohesive and, and reasonable manner. So um, this was circulated to the board in advance for your review. So I'll just run through it uh, pretty quickly, but please feel free to stop me. Um, one of the comments that the planning board had, uh, a couple of the comments were regarding the on-site residency, uh, both in context of the temporary residency for um, artists to come and stay in the space and utilize the facilities, um, as well as another concept that was incorporated is permanent lodging for full-time employees who are needed in order to make sure there's um, an efficient uh, and safe operation of these types of facilities. So one of the things that the planning board had suggested was that there should be, um, for the permanent housing, the, the residences should be limited to smaller size units. Um, the planning board said one and two bedrooms. I actually put in their studios as well. Um, and then with less than 50% being two bedrooms, uh, one of the other suggestions the planning board had was to try to make sure that there wasn't going to be um, an overutilization of the residential aspect of these uses. Um, and so th there's there were the concepts that was suggested, which I think makes sense, but obviously it's ultimately up to the board, is that um, you can only have the amount of residences as would be permitted by um, the density allowed under the zoning. So um, in this type of situation, the minimum lot size under the code that's being proposed for these types of uses is five acres. So th these are going to be generally larger size lots. So the example that's given in the law so that um, it's clear to uh, the public when you're reading it is that if you're in the R30 zoning district, then you need a minimum lot size of 30,000 square feet. So you can only have the number of residences that would be permitted if you know you maxed out the the, the lot size that the lots in in a subdivision. So if you got as many thirty thousand square foot lots as possible, how many residences could you get out of there? And so that would be the number of uh, the maximum number of residences that you could have in this type of facility, which which I think makes sense um, if the board is okay with that. My question was, um, it's permanent residence to support the artist community and the you know the temporary residents there is no residency without actually working there correct if they can't rent to somebody correct 
Uh, so the only I, the only I didn't find that defined. It, 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 you're correct. It's not expressly stated that that's the only residency. So what it does is it enumerates the types of residency you can have, but we can certainly put in there so that it's abundantly clear that there can be no renting to anyone unless it's for the artist community. Unless it's part of their or, compensation as or a full time employee that's serving that that, that their function is served by living on the property. Right. Okay. So I think that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, uh, previously it was in the it was in the draft and it still remains that the maximum number of permanent um, units for, for permanent resident um, employees is 15 percent. It, there was also just to, sort of some restructuring of everything because the the residency section got a little bit um, a little bit more detailed. So they you still have to comply with the requirements of the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, and we did specifically add that you have to put, comply with those requirements for a multifamily dwelling. So you have to you know provide the same safety mechanisms as would be required as if you were an apartment building, so to speak. And, and then also that the total number of residences, including both the temporary artist related residences and the permanent lodging um, will be determined during the site plan and special permit review. And it will not exceed, um, it, it, it can't exceed that unless they go back in for amended approvals. And then the planning board had a couple of suggestions regarding the temporary outdoor art related events, just um, reframing um, some of the wording. It had, was originally um, stated that if if they if the anticipated number of people that would be there, including participants, staff, volunteers, and others, um, would exceed 75 people, then they would require some sort of additional permit. But um, I think it would be good to just have a a concrete number instead of an anticipated number, um, because with the law, you just you want something that's that's easy to follow. And so, um, if someone does think that they're going to exceed that, then they they should err on the side of caution. And it also provides that if an event is going to be held concurrently or partially indoors and outdoors, that they still have to comply with the requirements for the outdoor related events, because obviously those are more um, sensitive because um, there are, it, this use is permitted in residential districts. And so you do have residential homes that are nearby. And then another thing that uh, we thought about in the context of uh, the special event policy is that um, there are certain criteria for what qualifies as a special event, and then there's certain exemptions, which we'll talk about in the next um, agenda item. But if if a use like this, where you're an artist community, if you're going to be holding events outdoors that exceed that the criteria set forth for a temporary outdoor event, then even if you wouldn't qualify under the criteria for a special event, uh, we think it would be beneficial to at least have the property owner submit the, the application form so that the town is aware of the event. And so if there is um, certain services that need to be provided or just so that the town is aware of it, so, so that you know, if they get calls from residents or um, the town can, can appropriately respond. Uh, but in that situation, in fairness to, to these types of uses, if they are going to be submitting an application for a special event permit where the special event policy doesn't necessarily require it, then we would waive the application fee. But if, if it's a special event under the code and they have to submit a special event um, application, then they, they pay the fee just like any other property owner would. Give an example of that, please. Can, I'm not sure what your example of which event would fall under filing that as temporary, but not actually paying it as event permit, but not. Well, right now, so for instance, a wedding. Right now, the way that it, this, and we may be cleaning that up in the context of all of this. Um, and this is something that we talked about 
when the town board adopted the special event policy, um, the way the village had enacted their law was that there were exemptions for, um, for I have it open. Um, yeah. That's it. Are we talking about it in the next chapter? I, it, I mean, the other thing is, it's hard to anticipate everything that could possibly exactly. come up. So I, the, the instance in which I can think of off the top of my head is a wedding. Um, that may not always be the case, but um, you know, it just makes sure that if, an, if a large event is being held of over 75 people or is going to have amplified sound that exceeds the close code, um, that the town at least knows about it in advance so that they can plan accordingly and be prepared to address um, any issues that may come up. Okay, so a non art related. Right. Okay. Could be. Well, no, if, if it's outdoors, it doesn't matter. If it's, right. if it's outdoors and exceeds the, the standards that are set forth in this provision. So if it's if it's going to exceed 75 people, if it's going to have, um, if like I said, if they're going to have amplified sound that exceeds the standards set forth in the town code, um, if they're going to require municipal support services, then even if it is art related, if it's outdoors, Okay. Then they still have to. Then, then we get to the next section, which addresses non-art related events, because the, the intent of this is to create an artist community and art related type use. So what we want to make sure we at least are aware of is if these uses are starting to become more event venue type uses, which um, isn't really what's intended as far as I'm aware. The board may feel differently, but um, you know, it's supposed to be focused on the arts. That's not to say that these types of uses might not be appropriate for event venue type events, so to speak. Um, but in that type of situation as well, um, it, it, they would make an application for a special event permit to the town so that the town board is aware that these events are happening. And so they can, we, they can be addressed appropriately. Awesome. Anything that's not art related. Right. Yeah. So, Art related outdoor, if you exceed certain standards, 75 people, um, amplify music. Um, anything that's not art related, yes. Special event, yes. Okay, and will we fall under art related or not art related? Mm -hmm. That's a whole that different filming. It's, it's yeah. own filming. There's a separate, there's, a, there's another section that talks about. Just ask it. Yeah, right. a film screening would be an art related event. But okay, filming, filming is goes is, under the filming. Right. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Right. So, and so that, yeah, that there are, the town does have certain regulations and requirements with respect to filming, with respect to beekeeping, as you many of you know. Um, <laughs> so, the, 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 the thing is, there are a lot of other provisions of the code that kind of get pulled in at different points in time. And so, you know, this may, this may require revisiting in a year or two. I don't know. You know, it's just um, we're trying to move forward, kind of thinking about what could happen, what um, and what would be beneficial to the town while making sure that it's being done um, in a safe and, and responsible manner. And trying to find everything in order to create a artist would do these yeah. things. <laughs> and initial notification would be first to the building department or the town supervisor's office. No. It, our, our special events, for the way that the special event permitting works is that the application is made through recreation, um, through the uh, community pass program, and there are certain questions that they need to answer about, you know, how many people are in, in the attendance, what's your plan for, you know, safety and traffic control and blah, 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 blah. So we'd be asking them to complete all of that information. And if it's art related and it's over, you know, these, these things, they would have to pay a fee. If it's not art related, they would go through with this, with the special event permit process, just like any other property owner that's holding a special event. Right, but after recreation, then where does the process continue? So the way that our special event um, uh, law works is that there's tier one events and then tier two and tier three events. Tier one events can get administratively approved by the recreation superintendent, and there's certain criteria. I don't have it all in front of me of how many people and you know what qualifies to those special events. Yeah, it's too many events. Yeah, yeah. for for level two and level three events, those those events have to be circulated. The application gets circulated to different town departments, and if none of those town departments object, you know they have to review it with you know certain criteria. Give them the opportunity to say, oh, we don't have enough staff that day. We don't, you know, whatever the issue might be. Um, and if 
the application is denied because town staff has waited and said that they do not believe it should move forward, the applicant can appeal to the town board for um, for an appeal if that decision. So it depends on the it depends on the the scale and the scope of the event. So most okay. events just get administratively approved by the recreation superintendent, but when it hits that level of having 300 people. The application itself, which has all of the details of what the event is, what their plan, you know, all of those questions, it gets circulated to those those staff members, and people either say thumbs up, thumbs down for whatever reason. There's certain criteria that they can give a thumbs down for, um, and it goes from there. Okay, I mean, I have further questions on this that have to be answered now, but um, in the notion of like oversight. I'm just wondering if where in the process, like the building department gets involved and where the town supervisor's office. Well, so in the event in terms of notification. In the in the in the event of a level two or level three event, it would be circulated to the building department. Okay. And they would be one of the the entities that if you know they're gonna have a tent or they're gonna have, you know, certain, you know, certain things have to do with fire safety and um, you know, those sorts of things. That's where yeah, yeah. yeah, that's when the um that's when building inspector would weigh in and say, okay. I need to see XYZ from them and um and and go from there. So I mean it's a process we've had in place for like almost yeah, two, year, two years now. And um so far, it's worked out fairly well, um, but part of, part of the reason for it also was the, the concept of the special event permit um, originated in the village. Um, and because we have a shared recreation department and a lot of shared services, um, and often people don't know if they live in the village or the town, <laughs> um, it seemed to make sense from an administrative standpoint. Um, to have the, a similar process, and, and the town board did tweak it. It's I can't, I won't say that it's exactly the same as the villages, but that was kind of where the concept derived from. And I will just also say that from you know the staff side of the law, but sort of how things have kind of happened in practice is there is a, a group that is a, a village staff and town staff that's called OEM, the Office of Emergency Management, and we on a monthly basis and usually at those meetings, our recreation superintendent does usually do a quick run through of the application that he's the applications that he's received and what's going on, even if it isn't a level two or a level three event. Everybody at the meeting, and it's generally aware of what's going on. In Village. And that way, also the rec superintendent can, you know, kind of correlate if an event is being proposed in the town and the village at the same time, and perhaps weigh in that maybe this event shouldn't happen on this day because there's another large event happening in the village. Um, it's good that there's coordination there, I'm sure. Okay. So, just another finishing up with the. Uh, um, another thing, because uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about having the residencies and the potential for, for large events, uh, having a fire safety action plan for the property and the structures that would be submitted to the building department uh, prior to occupancy. tweaks to the uh, renewal process for special permits. Generally, the special permits are renewed by the zoning board. Um, here, the concept is basically originally it goes to the zoning board, and then the zoning board will set a period for renewal. And then assuming everything is operating properly, there aren't any issues, then instead of, because these are generally not for profit type uses, instead of them having to go back through the uh, application process, have consultants come to the zoning board. Um, if, if there are no issues, then it can be renewed administratively by the building department. Um, so we kind of expanded a little bit on the types of information that would have to be provided with that renewal application in order to be able to assess um, whether it's appropriate to have it done administratively or whether the uh, property owner should have to go back to the zoning board. And so two of the things that we uh, added were copies of all violations, orders to remedy, appearance tickets, orders, judgments, just basically anything that happened that went wrong um, so that the, the town knows about that right off the bat when the building department gets the application. And then copies of all the special event permits that had been issued 
um, during the period of during either the, the first permit period or the renewal period as the case may be, um, because it may be useful. Um, and this will be something we'll talk about in a few minutes um, to see how often these types of special events are happening and whether you know that needs to be accounted for differently in the code um, or if they're if it's having any impacts or if there should be any uh, restrictions on the number of special types of events that can be held. So it, it just seemed like useful information. And then um, instead of just a statement that they're that their applicant is in compliance, a sworn statement, um, but obviously that wouldn't be able to be provided if there have been any of the issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also expanded the town personnel that would initially look at any renewal application to include the town planner and the town council. That's substantively, the, the, those are the big things that were changed. So um, if the board has any comments or you know anything that you want to see changed or added, uh, we can talk about that. Otherwise, we're scheduled to continue the public hearing at your meeting on the 22nd. Okay. Yeah. I'm good. The only thing uh, I'd be curious about the board's opinion is um, 9 p.m. for the an art related event to add the amplified sound. Can you add early to me? Is that for amplified sound? Right. 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 No, right. Like during the summer. During yes. the summer month, Dark. there's a screening or movie screening or something of that nature. It, it gets dark very late sometimes. Yeah, just again, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, maybe we can just put you like just the, uh, let's think about the explanation or like, yeah, if they can appeal or they could apply for a special permit, right? To, well, I see that or not. Well, right now it says no, no amplified sound at all over 9 p.m. after 9 p.m. Um, whereas the, the concept for these types of uses is that they can have amplified sound as long as they don't exceed the town code. So I guess we could take a look at what the noise code currently provides for in terms of uh, sound at, so, so you don't think it would. It's low, it's really low. It's like speaking. Okay. Um, I mean, I agree. Like, I, and I have thought about that a number of times. Right? That it's for you know, again, in the summer. I mean, we know just because the concerts go till nine, people still dancing until nine thirty or ten, right? At the in the in the height of the yeah, summer, we get the you know, it's, it's dark. Um, the difference is that park is in the middle. Of, you know, perhaps the there perhaps area. there could be a different standard for weekdays versus weeknights. I mean, first weekends. weekends. Yeah. That's a good idea. And, and we, one of the things I didn't mention is that um, for any temporary outdoor events, uh, they have to notify the supervisor's office within two business days. So, um, you would do for 10 o'clock for, for 10 o'clock for weekends. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's for the summer. For July, July, July. Yeah, it's not August. Yeah, and then if we get any complaints from the neighbors, we can report. Okay, so we'll, uh, the board will continue the public hearing next week. We'll see what type of tech feedback, if any, we received, and then we can take it from there. But obviously, there has been a lot of um, thought and consideration from the board, from your staff and consultants, the planning board, um, and the county, and the members of the public in this. So um, the goal is to get it through in a, in a way that makes sense. And again, we know. How valuable the arts are to communities. And uh, we want to make sure that we continue to make it possible for artist communities to exist in Osney and uh, in a way that uh, I think uh, embraces the arts and also brings the arts to, to, to people's community, makes it more easily accessible. Um, so I'm grateful to the board for considering this and also uh, you know happy that we have at least one. Uh, artist community and community in, in Austin town, and maybe there this will open the door for others. We, we shall see. Um, and that's you know again how we have to be thinking about this is in the context of 
what yeah. other, yeah, what other, where else this this may happen and how. Um, so, somewhat related to what we've been talking about, um, it came to our attention recently that there was a bit of a loophole in our special events law regarding weddings. Um, it currently states that weddings are not considered special events as long as permission is granted from the property owner. The intention of this was to allow households to hold small backyard weddings on the property for friends and family members without obtaining a special event permit. Um, it wasn't intended to allow for commercial rentals of space to be used essentially as event spaces. Uh, so we want to take a little bit closer look at that again, somewhere in, in the uh, context of uh, this as well. So turn it over to Tony. And I think you pretty much said it. <laughs> um, so um, in the special event law there, just to briefly recap, um, there are certain criteria that um, qualify something as a special event and that's delineated in the code. Um, and then there are certain events that are exempt from requiring a permit. Um, and generally what you find with these are that they're events that are designated for a specific purpose. So a regular sporting event held at facilities approved or authorized, a student assemblage at a school, um, a funeral procession, um, a gathering for religious purposes held at facilities which are approved. So we, block, block, block parties on dead end street. So for the most part, you, you know, you have a concept of the use in a space that's contemplated for that use. Um, and so when we were actually uh, looking, when the town board was looking at this law last year, um, this provision, a wedding, birthday party, family reading, graduation party, religious observances, or a similar gathering limited to the invited guests held on private property with the consent of the property owner. Um, I think it, the way it was, was originally proposed from the village was that it had to be a family member or some sort of relative. And that seemed um, a little bit restrictive. What if it was a friend or something like that? Um, but, to, but to the supervisor's point, um, it seems like the, the, the intent was that to, was to have a backyard type of event, not to. So can we say residential properties only? I just have one quick question before we get to that. What, what happens with properties that actually are event spaces? Does that, what happens? Like, are those separately? Permitted for that in there. I mean, I restaurant or something like that. Want to have a, a wedding? It's a commercial property. I mean, we, I would have to. Look, I, I would have to look at the code and see what the requirements are for a restaurant and what they're permitted to do. Okay, I just don't want to preclude yeah. it. I, I just think we have to think <laughs> what the. I don't know if the story for, but, I just want to. No, I know, but I think that again, I the intention was more like it. Even for for residential property, you don't want. I mean, that, and this actually came up recently in a neighboring community where you know you heard that you know residential property they started renting it out. Yeah, for like Airbnb. Right, right, and for weddings. For weddings, that whatever. Um, well, that kind of goes to the the other issue that came up earlier was um, potentially putting a limit on how many types of these permits you can get in the year, um, which would which would necessarily preclude. Um, that type of occurrence. Right. If you can only do it but so many times. Right. Unless that's what you're unless you're unless you're properly zoned for it and you're allowed to do it. Right. Like the Bernard Right. They're, they're actually yeah, they're illegal non-conforming use. Right. That's what that's and that's what that's really the only one that I, I that I'm familiar with that I could think of that that is a quote unquote event venue. Right. But if somebody is using uh same with like any of our restaurants like fire or air or you know terrorists or something like that to have a wedding. They, which happens a lot would they come to us for a special permit for a wedding probably they wouldn't it really would not the purview of their business that's my question right is is it in the purview of their business that's a restaurant as a restaurant a lot of the restaurants have small weddings yeah. birthday parties etc baby showers like theoretically we were talking about club that right that have this PCA could have a wedding theoretically. So, well, I think that would be well different than restaurants. They, it is. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think it's, you know, as you say, probably get a special firm. And when he's, they were, right, right, would be where it's not there. So maybe where hospitality is not 
in primary function. How about the fully enclosed eating and drinking establishment is how, how it's referred to a public bar or restaurant where food and or beverages are served within the confines of a building that specifically includes excludes establishments or parts thereof which serve food outdoors, whether on a terrace. Um, that's the only definition for us. So yeah, here we go. Business enterprise proportion thereof engaged in the preparation of retail sale of food and beverages selected in the whole menu. Um, you know, maybe this is something we can bring up to, to Valerie in the context of the, the bigger scale zoning amendments that, that we're going to be looking at. Um, you know, for the purposes of what we're talking about right now, you know, if 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 the if the board gives guidance as to what you would like to see, um, I think we can certainly craft some language. So so you would like to see a situation where a restaurant or some sort of you know food and drink establishment can host a wedding yeah, or some sort of event. Have, they just don't exceed their seating capacity. I think you would have to right you have to have Um, we don't have a lot of those at yeah. all. I mean, it's not period. So, they want the events permit to require a gamer call to also, and or a restaurant to also get a race permit for what they do with this. But, if it's put in, also like a white chip on the rest of it. No, I don't think that was the intention at all. It's not yeah. the intention. We just want to make sure it's not the consequence. Okay. Okay, so we want to go back to that. I mean, but the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, this wouldn't be harmful. All it would do is it would create an administrative process so that the town knew that these large types of events were happening. Um, so, but is to your point, as long as they're not exceeding, you know, their their permitted occupancy for a restaurant, right? And what's the downside of having, I mean, you know, the artist community hosting a wedding, I mean, talk to me about the upsides and downsides of allowing that. It's not not allowing it. It's right. just requiring, Third and place. it's not just artist communities. It's any type of space, any space. that wasn't really, uh, unless you, unless the board feels differently, we can leave it as is. Um, but you know, the, the intent was my understanding was more of a backyard type thing on a private, you know, residential right. property. Uh, that, was our, not, that was our intention. Right. So, but it's, it's become, it's come to our attention that that's, that's not how it can be interpreted. So if, if the board wants to let larger scale venues hold those types of events on a commercial basis um you know that's that's fine it just seems like there should be um some oversight or knowledge because what you don't want to see is is a, a, a use being created that wasn't what was intended not just for artist communities but for you know any type of any any any, any, any type of you know commercial retail type space because right now, any type of retail, you know, a store could hold a wedding. Or, you know, a, a property who decides that I've got a nice backyard and I want to rent it out to people for weddings. Right. They have the so, consent of the property owner. So under our code, potentially that would be covered. And I don't think that was, you know, the intention when this was discussed initially. I mean, in the event that somebody did have large property and they did want to rent, they wanted to rent it out for whatever reason, um, if they, they, they could have applied for variance, right? I mean, that's that would be half for them. They would have to get a use variance, which is right. virtually impossible to get. Right. Okay. You would have to demonstrate that you can't make any reasonable rate of return off of your property as its own. I, okay. well, I can't make any more than mine. <laughs> You're not entitled to the to the highest and best use. But um, a use variance is is right. So you're basically saying that you now I want to have a commercial use of residential, right? Which is the antithesis of right. zoning, right? Right. Right. Well, that's certainly something the board can look at. You know, yeah, we need to look at that. 
as part, as part of the, the, the larger scale zoning changes that come out of the comp plan. But I think, you know, for now it's, it's more of a narrow issue of um, making sure these laws can, can coexist and that, and that things don't fall through the cracks. I just think there should be some delineation between this is what restaurants, places like the Briarcliff Manor, this is what they're allowed to do. And then this is everyone else. Because they should they need, I feel like, less oversight than the other types of properties. Well, would it also be possible to designate it as, you know, in residential zones, residential properties where you're I don't know, single so, family like, residential like single family residential, right? Then you could just, you know, exclude North State Road or any other area where um physically those other uses might exist. Things are on zone parameters. Right. And right. Not that the idea is yeah, for sure. you know a residential, a, a wedding or a birthday or whatever that's being held for non-commercial purposes without without money be exchanged changed. I don't have to say that in a you know legal way. But again the idea of it being this backyard birthday party wedding for a family member or a friend. Uncompensated is what you say. Right. No, no. I think it's that's that's challenging to enforce, I think, uh, or to monitor. Um, yeah. You know, if, if, if this is just an initial discussion because it came up right. in the context of looking at the artist communities law. So um, if the board wants to pursue it further, um, we can we can take a look at it. And, you know, I could talk to Valerie and John and come back to the board, um, but I don't think they need to move forward concurrently. I think the board can move forward with the artist communities law um, because we did try to address that in the context of these types of the yeah. uses in that law itself. But um, just for anything else that may be floating around there. And again, um, to your point, it's impossible to contemplate every scenario that could possibly come up, you know, but artist community especially. So, so um, not just artist community, but any type of use, you know. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to to kind of plug holes as as they come to our attention. Okay, so we'll consider it working. Um, so we feel that the current that's current um proposed artist community provisions will cover the weddings when coupled with the events. Yes. Okay. Correct. Right. Please leave that. Correct. It's a fly for uh, session. It's just fly for session. Okay. okay. Because it's not within the purview of the yours. Correct. Uh, no okay. Yep. Yeah. Lori? Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So up next. Remember, over the past year or so, we have relaxed residency requirements in our code for positions subject to public officer's law, like court attendance and constable. Two positions that currently require obsolete residency are deputy tax receiver and deputy town clerk. We have been approached by the department heads of these related offices to see if the board would consider relaxing the residency requirements for these positions as well to open up a hiring pool for any future vacancies and protect current employees if they ever need to move outside of Austin for financial or family reasons. Since we have a bit of a template now, is the board comfortable moving forward with this change for the conditions as well? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm comfortable moving forward with it for folks who live here and then move. But I'm not so sure about this general. Can we say preference given to residents? I mean, I think that's always been in the, um, you know, when we review these blogs, there's like an intro. I mean, okay. just so you know, I mean, sometimes people come start working here. They come in one position and then want to hire them to another position. They've already moved. Now they've been trained to, in a particular office. Yeah. And, you know, that, you know, it's just, it's just how many towns have these residency requirements? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. A person who, and I get it, but 
I think in these particular um, in these particular roles, I think in, in the interest of like succession planning, and because those right now these those the titles of town clerk and receiver of taxes are elected positions, I think there's probably always going to be an incentive to want to hire asking residents into those deputy positions from a you know again succession planning training perspective. But yes, you know we haven't been approached by employees saying. What if I have to move, or you know, I've got an employee in this office that if somebody moves on, this person's already trained and ready to go. Can we hire them? So, um, you know, that's that's kind of the concern. These are still these are unionized employee, you know, employees too. Um, so the, these employees are in the union; they're not exempt um, in that regard. Um, yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I think the extent that we can. Not already codified that would be a preference, at least to residents, mm -hmm. if that's possible. That would be good. We're done with that then. All right, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn to executive session for advice of council, personnel, and contracts. So we'll move. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next Tuesday, November 22nd, for a legislative session. Have a great night and see you at all those wonderful events around town this week.